Let's talk about hierarchy and storage a little bit. Uh, so there's, there's all these conversations that people have around um, hybrid storage systems versus all flash storage systems and stuff, right? The, the, and you know, the, the whole thing is, uh, is total nonsense in, in a lot of regards, right? The, the Gardner AFA characterization is, is a very, very weird subset of storage offerings, right? The, the you know, being dismissed or categorized as a hybrid offering is also a very weird thing. Um, I hope one observation that falls out of this is that the idea of hybrid systems is not going anywhere anytime soon, right? In fact, I would argue that in not very many years, all storage systems will be hybrid, right? They just won't have disks, right? You have to figure out how to get the economics out of this dramatically different set of price points. And so let me, let me try and justify that with a little bit of data. Um, Right after Storage Field Day last year, we wrote a driver for 10 of our developers in the lab, and we stuck them in their Linux boxes, and we just took a log of every single I.O. that they did for a year, right? Just as a you know, bit of data to work with. And so it's like 7 billion I.O. Uh, trace. Right? It's the biggest storage trace I've worked with in terms of both time and absolute number of events. Um, it's really hard to do trace collection and storage, and so this is like a... Uh, a challenging thing, but since we have a company and we can force people to stick stuff on their desktops, it's great. Um, so the total transfer over the years is about 28 terabytes. Um, the total stored data is about 5.1 terabytes, and these are Linux developer desktops, so this is not indicative of any other workload that you see in the universe, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, we're going to try and draw some really coarse lessons about this, not, not specific ones. Um, so let's look at that data. Um, where did it go? Up here. Oops. So first of all, how old was the data after it had been stored for a year? Right. This data was never accessed in the year. Right. This more than half of the data in the trace, right, stored. There are no IOPS to it. Right. So you should definitely put that stuff on flash. <laughs> it doesn't compress necessarily that well either. Um, there's this thing called the 80-20 rule, right? It's commonly talked about in, in storage system design. 80% um, of the workload goes to 20% of the data, right? This is an example of that, right? That, that the bulk of stuff, right, the, the hottest data is accessed um, within a month, or a very small subset of the data is accessed within a month, and, and the majority of it just falls off. Now, let me show you this in a different way. There's this really cool library called D3, which is a JavaScript graphing library that you've maybe seen and I've become obsessed with. So we've been playing around with it in the office. I, I have help with these things. But this is a, um, a set of two characterizations of that same trace. If your cache was this big and it was an LRU, right? So if you were just doing flat LRU and you applied it to the trace, this is the fraction of the requests in the trace that would hit in Flash. Right? And so what you see here is that a 32 gig flash hits a huge chunk of data, right? It hits 35% of data. And the flash is diminishing returns. Right? As you go, this is an intuitive thing. But let me put some money behind that for you. Right? So up here, right, I hit 35% of the requests, right? My data access density, if I were to think of accesses as a density over the storage, is I am serving 144 gig per gig of flash, right, over the year, right? So a gig of flash is getting 144 gigs of transfer. And so if I normalize the cost of that flash to a totally imaginary number, right, to a dollar, right? So I just say the 32 gigs of flash here, right, I'm going to pay a dollar per gig of data transfer. So we ignore the dollar per gig capacity number because it's nonsense, right? Think about the actual like Amazon version of this where you're paying per data transfer. If that's a dollar here, let's look at what happens as I move out, right? As I move out, right, to, st so this is steps of doubling the cache size, right? And what you see is as you double the cache size, your hit rate definitely improves, but the value of the storage falls dramatically, right? To $1.50, to $2.25, to eventually, when everything's on flash, $11 per gig served, right? And this is kind of enough to get all the requests in the trace in. 
And so the thing that this should tell you is if you're going to spend homogeneously on Flash for this whole thing, <laughs> why? Right? You should take a bunch of the money for this and spend it over here. That's going to give you much better value. Right? Similarly, if you're going to do dedupe or compression or talk about inline stuff, you should be much more aggressive with that stuff here than here. Right? And so the conversations that, that you guys are subject to around a lot of these decisions are, are simple to the point of abstracting and obfuscating you know, some of the stuff that's really useful in terms of thinking about these, these systems. Right? It is not a question of all flash versus not all flash. Right? It's a question of even in all flash, let's use faster flash up here. Right? Let's maybe not inline dedupe the stuff that has NVDIM access times of you know, nanoseconds because that's going to be really expensive. Let's destage de that dedupe or compression a little bit because the relative cost of that inline processing is much lower as I move out. Right? And there's, there's lots of concerns. So I'm, I'm really just trying to emphasize the heterogeneity of some of this stuff. Um, okay, now. Okay, so what should we do? Put everything in Flash. Wait a second. No, no, no. Let's do NVDIM instead. This was like the last bit of the talk that I wrote last night, so you can tell that I was really starting to, uh, <laughs> to, to flounder. Um, okay, so I want to tell you how we solve this, um, or how we are starting to solve it. So tiering and caching have both been around for a long time as techniques, and we still don't agree about what they mean in a lot of senses. Um, one thing that is common to both strategies is that they're usually really, really uh, vaguely implemented. Right? So you, both tiering and caching demand an enormous amount of metadata to do a good job. Right? Ideally, what you would have is a piece of metadata for every single piece of data in your system that tells you when the next time that data will be accessed is. Right? Because then you could do a perfect job of this. That is the sort of like theoretical basis for, for where you know, cache algorithms are designed. That's the thing that you measure against. It's optimal forward distance. But you can't obviously look forward in time, so you use LRU as an approximation. But even tracking the last access time of every piece of stored data is super expensive. Right? It, it involves you know, a significant fraction of the data that you store to track that. And making decisions off of it typically involves doing a whole bunch of like, scanning and investigation of that stuff. And so this is why the, the techniques that systems have for caching and tiering are super primitive and haven't changed very much in a really long time. Right? They don't have enough information to work with, and it's not their fault. Um, and so we actually um, have a paper um, that, we, that we did this year. So we worked with a bunch of algorithms guys from, um, uh, there's a prof at UBC that did his PhD at MIT that I worked with closely and uh, one of his uh, students and two of the guys in the office. Um, and we looked at this data structure called uh, hyperloglog. -log. And so this is where your ears are going to probably start breathing, bleeding. So um, does anybody know what a bloom filter is? Uh, <laughs> Somewhat. I mean, okay. So what I want to do is I want to build a per-object characterization of how a piece of data is accessed over time. Right? And I'd like, to, I'd like to know how much unique data you access for each volume or object forever. Right? So I'd, I'd, if I have that, I can do all sorts of smart things with caching and tiering. Um, but that's going to be a really expensive trace to collect and analyze. Now, a bloom filter is kind of, it, we don't use these at all, but it's a useful way to explain what we do. So a bloom filter is this way of telling whether or not you've seen something before in computer science. And so if you have a key, right, or a value, um, what you can do is you can take that value, you can stick it through a hash function, and this gives you a bunch of bits. And then you or it into a bit field which is just a fixed size bunch of bits. Right? So you kind of imagine taking some name of a library book or something, and you turn it into a stamp, basically like a rubber stamp that kind of vaguely represents like a QR code or something. You just stamp this. And you can then, at any time in the future, ask whether this has seen that thing before. Because the bits in here are only going to move from 0 to 1. And if you take the same set of ones and ask if they're here, you can see that they're here. Right? So if I've got some thing called Andy, right, and Andy turns into a 1101, and I have Steven, and Steven turns into 1110, right? If I stick Andy in here, I get 1101. Right? If I look for Andy again, I know that I've seen it. If I look for Steven in there, right, 
I know that I haven't seen it. Right? The problem with bloom filters is if I then you know um, look for Tom, and Tom is just one one, and I've inserted Andy, I may think I've seen Tom. Right? So they're an approximate data structure. Right? So bloom filters are used to opt optimize lookups. Uh, and they're using a lot of like storage systems and data structures. They're a way of, of avoiding wasting time looking in a place where you know something is not going to be because it tells you definitively that you haven't seen something in it before. Okay? And so the way to think about a bloom filter is it's kind of a box, right? like everything in computer science, and it has a function to insert stuff, and it has a function that says uh, seen before. It does not have a function called count, and it does not have a function called remove. And seen before is imprecise, right? It may say yes when, when in fact it means no. So onto this stuff, there's a newer form of data structure that the math guys have come up with that's super cool. It is called a HLL, or a hyperlog log. Right. Um, Google wrote a paper about this a while ago. The math kind of came out of IBM Watson. And what an HLL does is it's like a bloom filter that does insert, has no idea what it's seen before, but can do count. So I can take a whole bunch of unique things, like addresses on disk, and I can stick them into this HLL, and I can find out about how many things are in it. Right? And I can't tell which things are in it. <laughs> it tells you just short of no information, but they're incredibly small. Right? They're on the order of like, small numbers of kilobytes right? to, to track a storage system that is terabytes to petabytes in size. And so what we ended up doing with this is we, we took this data structure and we apply them over time. So we built these things called counter stacks where as the reads and writes come through the storage system, we periodically stick these HLLs into the request stream, right? So as you're working with your object, in object metadata, we stick in these relatively small data structures, and we put all the addresses that you access for read or write into them. And over time, you get a series of these counters. And this basically lets you draw a curve on uniqueness over time, right? Um, the paper that I've got there does a much clearer and less like, head-exploding job of understanding this. Um, but it basically lets you characterize the workload very precisely. At a block level? At an arbitrary level. We use it at a block level. Right, so at a 4K level, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. you can say, and these have these other slightly weird property, which is that despite the fact you can't ask them whether they have seen a specific item or what they have seen, you can ask them pairwise whether they've seen similar things. And so this means that you can do stuff like say, you had a burst of traffic last night at 2 a.m. and you had a burst of traffic the night before at 2 a.m. Was it about the same? With very little metadata. And so there's two ways that we use these in the stack today. And you're writing this out as part of the data stream? Yeah. Um, so we've been working on this for a year and a half, and with the 2.0 release, we collect these for all the data, we store them on the data stream, and we ship them back to Coho. Um, so we have, uh, I mean, we have, as with a lot of sort of modern storage vendors, what we call on-stream, right? Yeah. Proactive diagnostics and stuff. But we ship these back. They don't actually contain any block addresses, right? They just contain a measure of uniqueness. And we can use them to do things like test new cache strategies and tiering strategies internally. We are actually close to the point where we can use them to recreate a synthetic workload that looks like a customer workload locally in terms of all of the aspects of the system that matter from a performance perspective. Right? And so when a customer is having high latencies and shouldn't be, right, the goal is to take this stuff and generate a test locally that reproduces the high latencies right? and go like, oh, yeah, we screwed something up. Let's figure out how to fix it. Um, so we collect and ship right now. I'll show you how it will roll out. Now, we do, you know, we do continuous integration and, and release things piecewise. And so the first way that this uh, kind of emerges in the stack um, there we go. Um, 
is this thing uses those stacks to basically age all of the data in the system. Right, so it tells you across all the data you're storing when the last time you accessed it was. Right, so it, it is a simple visualization that tells you how much flash you should probably have right, for your environment. Right, it's a really, really difficult thing to calculate. Some of the NFS products have this number. Right, they have a thing where they look at um, uh, times of last access on data, but what they really do is look at a time right, in, the, in the NFS metadata. And when you're storing VM images, a time is an a time for like a 10 gig object, right? So if you've touched that object last week, you're going to say that pointless, right? This is at a 4K granularity in terms of, of that stuff. Now, the, the richer way that we use this is actually... Is way to do anything where you programmatically exclude backup? Yes, like yes. That. So we're collecting these time series on every object, and we can compose them. So you can leave stuff out, and that's exactly the intention, is to help you make decisions about what stuff you, uh, you keep in or leave out. How would you want to ignore backup, though? Because if you're trying to size for flash, you don't care about backups for that? And some, the assumption is that you're actually making backups, but yes. <laughs> so I'm going to get on to the last thing, but um, I'll show you two ways that this shows up in, uh, in the UI, and one way that it shows up in, uh, in, in what we see locally. Um, I showed a preview of this last year, something that we had just started working with, and this is the sort of productized version of it, right? So this is a forecasting tool on flash hit rate uh, based on the number of uh, nodes that you have in the cluster. And what it lets you do is simulate purchasing more storage a week ago, right? And so you can run the workload through a cash model that we have on top of this and see what your hit rate would have been, right? And so what you see is, is the, the blue plot is basically the hit rate that you perceive, right, versus the stuff that missed. And as I scale that out, right, you see it kind of grow. And you can also explore through to figure out which workloads are problematic this way, right? So the idea is to be able to spot the workloads that are uncacheable, which is, you know, a realistic thing. Um, you know, workloads that do like large data sets, actually, like, you have to buy all of the cache. <laughs> And so knowing up front, before you know, the performance SE comes in and goes like, and it looks like you need some more flash, um, you, know, you can kind of tell early. Um, the other end of it is we actually allow you to plot hit ratio curves on these things. And this is that plot of those stacks, right? So th what this is saying is for this media server, to get to 100% hit rate, you need to go up to about a terabyte of storage. And with an LRU, you will get absolutely no benefit until you are close to being there. Right? The thing is so random in its accesses that it's just churning the LRU. Right? It's, it's forcing stuff that it's brought in out, and so there's no value to bringing stuff in. And so the way that this ends up being super useful in the system is LRU and variants of it, because nobody runs like traditional LRU. It's, it's just a really useful way of modeling stuff. If I have two workloads with graphs like that, and I have, you know, I have enough flash, right, to fit, I have that much flash, for example. If I run LRU or most traditional algorithms around fair, balanced allocation, what I will do is I will choose to give each of them half. Right? And neither one will win. They'll both actually thrash. And so a better decision in the face of noisy neighbors and stuff like this is to go, actually, you know, this guy wins. Right? And so one benefit is automated decision making around good utilization in the system. And another benefit is showing the administrator which workloads need the extra resources so they can make a decision to either penalize them because there's some you know, developer workload that is causing trouble or to spend on them because they need it. So in the graph you have here, well, you've got the media server selected. Yeah. And the, you see where the spike is and that's where you should have your, you should have at least that much flash yeah. to get benefit from yeah. it. Does that take into account the rest of the workloads that are on there or that's This is just for this, just this is one. just this workload, right? So this is the cache profile for this job. Now, these, well, the, these, the query engine that we built around this actually lets you combine these, right? So I can, I can add these up and build a profile for what you, what you need. Okay. Right. So, um, okay. Uh, Andy? Yes. You, you know you're saying if you've got two <clears throat> workloads like what you've drawn out on the board there, and, um, oh no, I guess you've already said it, you, you've got an ability to say that this one guy wins, so is there a way in your, utility, in your tool to say, 
this automate guy. Automate that? I mean. So this is, this is what we're, this is the next step with this. Like I said, this is like a piecewise thing. So we are collecting this data and actually um, the view we have of this are you internally. you looking at the SSD as the cache rather than DRAM at this point? Is that what you're talking about? It's, I mean, it's tiered because the data can live yeah. either or both places. Um, but I mean, this is the coho side sort of view of this thing. Right, so all the workloads off that box are being shipped back. So these are the dev traces that I talked about earlier. For this dev box, this is the hit rate and this is auto fit, right? So it's saying the point of best return for this workload is this, you get 89.1% hit rate, right? For another workload, right, like the database example, right, you see a much sharper elbow. Interestingly, this graph shows you the unique dark blue data relative to the total data accessed. Right, so this is over that week, how much data was unique. But and do, Just for my clarity here, right, yeah. if it's saying you need to put 100 gig of, SS, of tier one SSD in there for that workload, and I go and put that 100 gig in, but there are other workloads on the box, I don't have a way of isolating that particular workload. So that's what we will build with this. Okay. Right, so we will use this to inform so that you're allocation. you're not there yet with We're it, not there yet. but you're yeah. on the Absolutely, road. absolutely. So that's the path. So the, the first tier thing will be to make a more optimal global decision yeah. to do well for everyone. Sure. And secondly, we can't make that decision with the business logic because we don't know it, right? And so the second step is to show you the guys that are suffering for latency and yeah, let you and make then, the and call. And we make right? that call, yeah. right. So, um, so do you have in this, these charts right here, do you have an example of a cache unfriendly workload? Um, <laughs> or wasn't that the media server one? That, oh, uh, on these charts. Probably not the web. Well. Um, let's see, DB staging. Oh, there's one. Um, right, so this, this, here's a great example, actually. So this workload runs for a year and touches a whole bunch of unique data at the end of the year, right? So the way to think about this is it benefits, like, effectively nothing from flash through the year because at the end, it actually touched a bunch of that, that data that we... Uh, these are all the Linux so. developer traces? Some of these are. Some of these we pulled over from the, uh, from the Microsoft traces to so the web server and the database and stuff like but that. But I mean, with this hyperlog log, you're going to start getting this information from all your customer installations? If they turn it on, yeah. If they turn it on. Yeah. I mean, they can opt out. Um, last bit of this uh, is, like I said, we can Why compare these over time. Why would you let them opt out, Andy? Yeah, is it, is it uh, because of some sort of federal, processing overhead? Federal. Um, primarily, there are a bunch of environments that, that don't want to ship it. Um, okay. But... But yeah, I no, mean, there's, so come, there's, some customers don't want that sort yeah. of access. There's to the no system. privacy stuff with this because the Just amount of like the data this. reduction is so huge that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now the last bit of this is actually doing those comparisons over time. So this is days of the week, right? Months over the trace, and so you can see the um, right for each of these guys, um, right? The days that are hot, right? And you can get these breakouts, and so. One of the big goals with this is to be able to do things like when you look at these traces, you find out that in the middle of the night, there are often really destructive, cache destructive workloads that come in and pull a bunch of stuff out. That would out, be backup. Right, and backup and stuff. And you can, you can special case those by doing sequential access to detection and just go like, don't use the flash. But it would be better to pull the data that's gonna be accessed into the flash, right? And then push it back out when you're done. And with this, we can identify those regimes. Right? We can start to manage the contents of Flash based on what we see, because a lot of these accesses are very predictable and periodic at a macro. Hey, how far away are you from being able to productize that ability to isolate workloads? And um, I expect that the forecasting bit of the UI that I showed you will go in later this year in a point release, mm -hmm. um, or early next year, the latest. Like it's, it's done, with, we're cautious with a lot of this stuff. Um, the internal view, is done now yeah. we use it and the actuation on sizing we decided to ship with the backhauling of these things so that we could run it internally and make sure that we're not going to do anything oh, awful okay. right so we want to get a bunch of like yeah. production simulation against the thing before we before we go out with it